This program contains true stories of rescues. All of the 911 calls you will hear are real. Whenever possible, the actual people involved have helped us reconstruct the events as they happened. The bait and tackle shop that Linda and Ron Shams owned near their home in Onalaska, Wisconsin, had been a family run business for more than 20 years. As usual, the Shams spent most of the 1991 Memorial Day weekend working at their store. By Monday night, all they wanted was some quiet time at home together. They had been experiencing a series of robberies at the shop, which was located just across the tracks from their house. Since they had installed an alarm system a few weeks earlier, there had only been one attempt. We felt violated with the break-ins. We'd worked so hard, had, had been here for so many years, and uh, had never experienced this kind of, of attack, I guess you'd call it, personally, on the, on the business. That will now have to look for different jobs, because the number of patients is staying the same patient. The alarm woke us both up, probably 12, 15. Of course, Ron was up and going the minute the alarm was off. I said, Ron, wait, let's call the police. He goes, I'm going to go down there. And maybe I can catch the guy. gone off but they'll never catch the guy you know that was my feeling okay, what was your name? I also did hear the sound of a train and I did hear him blow his whistle as I was talking on the on the telephone to the police Workers on the train ran to try to help any victims. The conductor, Bill Varnum, called 911 to report the accident. 911 emergency. The guy was just an uh, empty pit in my stomach right away. Uh, I didn't know how many people were in it or anything. Uh, I figured right away we were going to have dead people. I went out on the deck to see why hasn't the alarm stopped. I thought for sure Ron would have gotten down there and turned off the noise. Tracy, we've got a car train accident at Sias' boat landing. Units with the Onalaska Fire Department were immediately dispatched to the scene. Can I see anyone? Nothing here. At this time, I might have been out on the deck for about a minute, and the telephone rang back, and the 911 dispatch center is calling me to find out, did I know anything about the emergency call that was placed at the same time mine was, the call that reported a vehicle train collision at the same location. Oh my God. I know in my heart it's Ron. He was the only vehicle that would have been at that location at that time. Ron was found pinned underneath the flatbed of the pickup any truck. Other, any other people with you? 
Our Alaska police officer, David Hawk, was responding to the reported burglary at the bait shop when he came upon the wreckage of the pickup. It was even hard to identify what it was because it was just a piece of metal with wheels attached. You by yourself? I was looking for uh, not much of a person left. Someone from near the truck yelled, keep her away from here. I thought he's in pieces. How do you get out of the truck that's been hit by a train without being in pieces? I, w I became some other person because I couldn't deal with it, possibly, because my whole life seemed to have just stopped. Within two minutes, rescue units arrived, including first responder paramedic Bruce Solberg. I heard someone underneath the truck screaming, get me out of here in a panic. And he told me his name was Ron Shams, at which point I identified myself as Bruce because I've known Ron for 20 years. Uh, hey, I'm going under. Get me out of here. Ron. What I surmised was that he must have been squeezed through that little opening in the back window because that would be the only way he would end up where he was. Just relax, buddy. We're going to get you out of here. we got the ambulance coming, okay? His panic level is at about 110% understandable because he has no clue what happened. He just knows that he's bleeding and hurting. Paramedic Dave Blocker also went under the truck to help Ron. Buddy, I need oxygen also. On further palpation of the right side of the chest, you could feel that the ribs weren't where they're supposed to be. That indicates we've got a critical situation because his lungs are going to collapse. We knew we had to get the pickup up off of him so that we could slide him underneath. Someone said it's going to be about another 20 minutes to get things established so that they can move the truck up off of him. But we needed to get him out of there now. In the meantime, they were outside trying to figure out how to get this pickup truck off us, which in itself was going to be darn near impossible because they thought they would kill us if the truck shifted. And then Dave and I said, we're not leaving our patient because you do what you have to do to save someone's life. I just stood still on the road and I couldn't cry. I couldn't, I couldn't express any emotions at all. I was just in a state of shock. It's nice and easy, Ron. Nice and easy, buddy. I got it. He hit hard. When we log rolled him onto his right side, the impact that he made created a two to three inch indentation into the ground. Is another indicator of the seriousness of his situation. <laughs> Dave and I put him on a longboard and figured that we didn't have a whole lot of time left before we lost both lungs totally. And then we were really in big trouble. Get you out of here. How's your lung? His right lung has now collapsed. I have nothing. At that point, I turned to Dave Blocker and said, We've got to go now. So I positioned myself underneath the bed of the truck and up against the tailgate, straightened out my legs, lifted up the truck enough so that he could go out underneath the bed and through the opening that we crawled through. We gave Ron about a 5% chance of survival due to the fact that both his lungs had collapsed and that he had gone through the trauma he had gone through. We anticipated reading his obituary within the next couple of days. I didn't see how my world as I know it now could go on without Ron. I see our life as, as so much together that without him, I would have to, I don't know, move, change, change everything because it just would seem so empty. Ron Shum suffered 18 broken ribs, two punctured lungs, cracked vertebrae, and a shattered shoulder blade. Five months later, the painful memories of that night still linger on. I think anger blinds people. I had one thing on my mind, and that was getting the bad guy. I thought I could beat the train, and I didn't rationalize what could have happened. I didn't, I didn't think it through. Ron certainly has paid for his attempt against that train. He's got a shoulder that will forever be stiff. I don't know to this day how Ron was able to uh, survive the train accident. There must have been an angel or a guardian looking out for him somewhere because you don't normally tackle a train and come out on the winning side. I was grateful to everybody involved. And I told my wife when I come out of this, we're going to have a party. And we did. 
with the damage to his vehicle, the injuries he incurred, we should have been going to his funeral instead of him throwing a thank you party. I think to a certain extent I look at everything with different eyes. You know, it could have been over so quick. And I've been given a second chance, as it were, to take a second look at yourself, take a second look at everything around you. Yeah. Oh, let's go get warmed up. Next.